And everybody said, Good evening, everyone. How are you today? Ready for the word? I pray the word will be a blessing to everyone in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for the privilege of coming for the workers' training. Thank you, Lord, because you've chosen us. And you've chosen us for a purpose. We pray that that purpose of choice into the kingdom, into the service, will be profitable and fruitful in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, you open our hearts to the scriptures. And we pray you apply the word to every heart in Jesus' name. Make us the kind of workers and leaders we ought to be. That your work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody shout, Amen. Amen. We're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Reading from verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It tells us here that God has a foundation to his work. He has a foundation to his word. He has a foundation to his will. And that foundation of God standeth sure. It stood sure. It standing sure. If it will forever stand sure. The foundation of God standeth sure. From the first time he chose and selected anyone for his service. He had laid a foundation. He had laid the cornerstones. He had laid the landmarks. And it stands sure. And it says it has a seal. That means a seal of approval. A stand of approval is on that foundation. It's on that principle. When he calls us to work, before he called the worker, the work had been outlined. And that work had been set firm not to change. It is the worker that will change to match the calling for the world. And then he says, the Lord knows them that are his. The people he has put in place from the time of Noah. He knew him. He chose him. And he told him, this is what you do. And the people he chose from the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He chose them for something. He knew them. And when he put them in place, he outlined what he wanted them to do and what he wanted them to be called Moses. And what Moses was to do was specific and well specified and lined out the same thing until this day. He has a work for us to do. And that work, he has already put his stamp of approval on. And he knows the people that are his. And he says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. And he's saying that if we're going to serve him, he's a holy God, we must be holy. He's a righteous God, we must be righteous. He's a just, impartial God, we must be just and impartial. That we depart, that we run away, that we avoid, that we shun every sin that is called iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. It's not his will that any vessel will be to dishonor. It's not the will of God that any worker, that any minister will be to dishonor. It wasn't his will that Aaron did what he did 
because he did it unto this honor, raising up an idol for the people. Instead of focusing their attention on the Almighty God, it wasn't his well what Korah did and Abiram did. They became vessels to this honor. That wasn't his will. It wasn't his will for Achan to have done what he did. That's why he died for that iniquity. But the choice is in our hand. It says, I put life and death before you. Choose life that you may live. We're free moral agents, and therefore we have the chance to choose. We have the opportunity to choose. We have the liberty to choose. When we choose sin, it's wrong. When we choose evil, it's wrong. When we choose iniquity, it's wrong. When we make ourselves vessels of dishonor, it is wrong. That's why he says in verse 21, if a man therefore, what's that therefore? He says, you have a choice, you have the liberty to choose right or to choose wrong, to choose what is good and to choose what is evil. But if you are going to make your mark, and you're going to have a profitable ministry. It says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, as adults, as workers, as leaders, we shouldn't be waiting for a mother to come and wash the baby. You're not babies anymore. We shouldn't be waiting for a preacher, a pastor, to come and cleanse the workers. You do that yourself. We're no more infants. That's why it says he purges himself. He cleanses himself. He purifies himself. He knows he's been chosen to the work. And his mind is on the work. And he knows the kind of worker that will be a good worker, a profitable worker, a gracious worker, an approved worker. He knows the standard of the word of God and the calling of God. And therefore, to fit in, to be a vessel unto honor, he purges himself from all these, and he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, a meat for the master's use, and prepared, ready, is ready. Anytime the call comes, it's ready. Any time the obligation arrives, he's ready. Any time, if it's the work he's been doing before, or another work that just came up and a new assignment, he is ready and is prepared unto every good work. Ready and prepared unto every good work. And now since he has said, put yourself, Cleanse yourself, prepare yourself so that you can be a worthy servant, an approved servant, a profitable servant. And it begins to tell us how to do that. In verse 22, flee also youthful lust. It says, you understand, the lusts, the inordinate affection will ruin your life will spoil your ministry and will make you unqualified, disqualified in the service. So as you see, any appearance of loss, youthful loss, filthy loss, fleshly loss come in, you flee and you follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord with a pure heart. Thank God we're not isolated in holiness, isolated in sanctification, isolated in getting ready and prepared to be ready for every good work. It says there are others. They too, they call on the Lord out of a pure heart. They've done what you are trying to do. They purify themselves like you are trying to do. They purge themselves like you are trying to do. And they have cleansed themselves from anything that will bring dishonor to the life of the minister. Anything that will bring dishonor to the work of the ministry. Anything that will bring dishonor to the ministry of any worker. Then it says in verse 23, but 
Foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid. It's saying if they ask any question privately, if it's foolish, it's if unlearned, don't even bother yourself looking for answer. Avoid it. If it doesn't go in the direction of the calling you have, of the ministry you have, don't even bother yourself to be looking for an answer. It says foolish and unlearned questions avoid if it's only related to things on earth. It's related to mundane things. It's related to um, maybe superficial things. It says just leave it alone. Whether they ask that question in church on Sunday or they ask you privately in the house fellowship, or they ask you that question in the public or in the office, don't waste your breath. Don't waste your intelligence. Don't waste your life answering questions that are foolish and unknowledge, knowing that they do gender strife. They don't gender salvation. They don't produce holiness. They don't produce righteousness. They don't produce heavenly citizenship. They do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. The servant of the Lord must not fight. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel. The servant of the Lord must not argue. But he must be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, here is the attitude of a real worker. Here is the attitude of a vessel unto honor that is purified, that is purged, that is prepared unto every good work, he is meek, he is gentle, he is compassionate, he is loving. He doesn't do anything in anger. He doesn't do anything with a furious temper. In meekness is instructing those that oppose themselves. What does that mean? They oppose themselves. When those Pharisees were opposing the Lord Jesus Christ, they were opposing themselves, they were shutting the door of salvation against themselves. When anyone opposes or contradicts or persecutes, or pushes away a preacher of the gospel. He's opposing himself because he's pushing away the only one that will show him how to get saved, how to get sanctified, how to get ready for heaven. But you will not be angry with them in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. He peradventure God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Those unbelievers and those backsliders and those churchgoers do not know that whenever they oppose the preaching of the word in any way, they are opposing their own salvation and they are hindering themselves from getting to heaven. God will give us grace and wisdom in Jesus' name. Did somebody shout amen? amen? Special tasks demand appropriate and trained hands to do them. The Lord has called us to the task and to the work of saving souls, to the task of converting and conserving souls. And it's a special task. And we need a special grace to do that. Higher tasks can only be done by prepared and better workers. The work he has called us to, they're great. The works he has called us to, they're high. The thing he has called us to, they're magnificent. They're incomparable to anything anybody can do here on earth. And since he has favored us to call us to such a high task, a heavenly task, 
We need to be well prepared so we can get it done properly. Our task is spiritual. We must be spiritual to do it. Our task is special. We must be special to do that. Our task is great. We must be gracious to do it. Our task is high. We must be holy to do it. Our task is heavenly. We must be heavenly to do it. Our task is demanding and incomparable to any other. And so our lives and so our grace must be incomparable to anything we see on earth so that we will qualify and remain equipped for the work he has given us to do. We must be better prepared. We must be clear-sighted. We must be committed. We must be diligent. We must be sanctified. We must be self-denying and self-effacing. We must be focused. We must be consistent. Verse 21 again. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet and suitable for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. We're looking at the subject tonight, sanctified tools for special tasks. Sanctified tools for special tasks. The task he has given us is special. And the tool that will get that work done will be sanctified. Sanctified tools for special tasks. Three things we're looking at. Number one, running the race with required holiness. Running the race. There's a race is set before us. I were to run that race with holiness. Not just every kind of holiness. It's not the holiness you might see in books, the holiness you might see defined and described by the people that do not know, have the mind of God, but required holiness. God has not kept us in darkness. He has not uh, uh, hidden the truth away from us. The holiness he requires, he gives us the explanation. He gives us the definition. He gives us the description. And he also tells us, he gives us directions, directives as to how we're to have them. Running the race with required holiness. Point number two, recognizing and recovering the running hirelings. Recognizing and recovering the runaway hirelings. The other people who should be with us in the work of the Lord. But they're running. They're not running the right direction. They're running the wrong direction. They're on the way, Jonas. They're on the way, prodigals. They're on the way, soul winners. They're on the way, workers. And they're not there when they ought to be there. Those run away or running higher leaves, we need to recognize them. There's a work for everyone to do, a work for you to do, a work for them to do. Recognize them, recover them, restore them, bring them back. Point number two, recognizing and recovering the running higher leaves. Point number three, reaching and reaping the ready harvest. Reaching and reaping the ready harvest. Isn't that the reason for our selection? Isn't that the reason for our being set apart? Isn't that the reason for our sanctification? Look at that verse 21 again. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet, suitable, and fit, for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. That's why, as we see the harvest is ready, then we reach out and we reap the ready harvest. Coming to point number one, there's a race to run. 
and that trace will run with required holiness. We're not coming to Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. You will come out from among them before God can send you back to them to reach out to them. You must come out of sin before you can reach the sinners with the grace of God. You'll be able to say, look at me. The grace of God came to me and the grace of God changed my life. And it's the same change and the same transformation and the same salvation I'm calling you to. You come out first before you go back to them to give them the word. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Here is what the Lord has said. And if you are not obey what the Lord has said, he will not make use of you. You might choose yourself. You might appoint yourself. You might plunge yourself into service. A service you are not ready for. A service you are not qualified for. If you are not obeying the Lord of the work, he will not give you the grace for the work of the Lord. If you are not submissive to the Lord of the work, you cannot be profitable to the, the work of the Lord. There must be obedience to the Lord of the work before the work of the Lord can prosper in your hand. Therefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And touch not the unclean thing. This is the Lord Himself. He's saying, don't even touch it. Some people say, I'm not eating it. That's not the point. Don't take it. Don't touch it. Don't smell it. Don't gaze at it. You know you are not going to eat it while you're carrying it. You know you are not going to wear it while you're buying it. You know you are not going to do anything with it while you're showing interest in it. Touch not the unclean thing. Then the Lord will know that you really mean you are not going to eat what he doesn't want you to eat. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. You see that again? There are people who are waiting. If the Lord wants me to be clean, he'll cleanse me. If he wants me to be righteous, He'll make me righteous. I won't do anything about it. I just believe in my normal life, normal sinful life, normal unsaved life, normal unconverted life, normal worldly life. And if God wants any change, He'll come and make the change Himself. He says, No. We have the promises of God. He will receive us after we come out. We have the promises of God. He will show favor unto us if we will not keep on embracing and touching that unclean sin. And we have those promises, he says, let us therefore cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. All filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It's one thing to be sanctified. It's another thing to keep sanctified. It's one thing to be holy at a moment of time by the grace of God. It's another thing to remain holy, perfecting holiness in the sight of the Lord. The Lord will continue to perfect holiness in our lives in Jesus' name. 
Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You know what he's saying there? He's saying what he has called us to do is not something so high we cannot reach to it. It's not something so wide we cannot get around it. It's not something so deep that we cannot dive into. Many others have done the same thing. Many others have had that same life of purity and righteousness and holiness. It says we have a cloud of witnesses, actually a great crowd of witnesses of those who were saved and were set free from sin, of those who were sanctified and they were made holy and they remained holy. He said there are people, many of them who are bad, who are rotten, who are evil. They came to the Lord and they became converted. A great cloud of witnesses. They came to the Lord and a mighty change, a mighty transformation took place in their lives. A great cloud of witnesses. We find people who had been habitually evil, but as they came to the Lord, the grace of God was mighty enough to turn them around, and it's not just one or two scanty number of people, a great cloud of witnesses. With those people and with those witnesses that have marked for us the path of victory and the path of holiness and the possibility of living righteous, pure, and holy. He says now, let's follow after. Let us lay aside every weight, not some weight. You can't say, Pastor, praise the Lord. I used to have 100 pieces of weight. I've laid aside now 70 of them and I've gone beyond half. It says, lay aside every weight, every weight, every weight. And it's here that will weigh you down. Weigh down your conscience. Weigh down your heart. Weigh down your very life. That you'll not be enthusiastic again to run the race that God has set before you. You know that weight. You know what always happens. And then you have that sinking feeling that heaviness of heart, and then you're unhappy and sad that that sin has taken place again, lay it aside. And the sin which does so easily beset us, the sin which so easily catches us, it may be the sin of anger, easily catches you, maybe the sin of being temperamental, you wear your temper on your skin, and you're easily offended, a little sin will trip you up. It says, that's the sin that does so easily beset you, something that will kind of excite an evil a disposition in your heart, and it happens easily. It's been happening for so many years. Why don't you wake up and say, I'm going to get rid of that sin. And then let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set now at the right hand of the throne of God. That's where we're going. We're going to heaven. I'll be there. I said, I'll be there. We'll be there together in Jesus' name. If we're going to be there, we have things to lay aside. We have things to confess and forsake. We have things to totally throw away from our lives so that we can be partakers of the required holiness. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 of that same chapter. 
For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, referring to God, for our profit. When he teaches us for our profit. When we are convicted for our profit. When he points at you and he says, Thou art the man for our profit. When he challenges you and he tells you to wash in the blood of the Lamb and be clean for our profit. When he mentions your sin, your shortcoming, and he mentions you're going astray, and he challenges you and he says, Turn away on the wise. A bad thing will happen is doing that for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's the required holiness. Partakers of his holiness. Verse 14. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. The idea of some people who have not looked at the word of God is to follow peace with easygoing people. The people that allow you to have your way, okay, I can follow peace with him. The people that will not challenge you when you are doing any evil thing, I can live at peace with him. The people that will not correct you, the people that will not uh, prepare you for heaven, I can follow peace with them. But the people who come, to chastise, to discipline, to correct, to point the right way to you, and to say that thing in your hand is not right. If you are going to get to heaven, drop it. They cannot follow peace with such people. But you know what it says? Follow peace with all men and follow holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I will see the Lord. Somebody there, I will see the Lord. Then you'll follow peace with all men. You follow peace with members of the church. Don't fight in the church. Don't fight outside the church. Whatever is the theme bringing interaction between you, land, houses, money, work, whatever, follow peace with all men. And when you come to the church, follow peace with all the members of the church and follow peace with the pastor. Follow peace with your leader. Follow peace with all men. When he rebukes you, submit and follow peace with him. When he corrects you, that's the right thing to do. Submit and follow peace with all men. When he says, if everybody in the church were like you, where will the church be? Don't take that. Don't be offended at that. Follow peace with him. He's trying to perfect the grace of God in you. You'll follow peace with your pastor in Jesus' name. I want a better amen than that. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 I read from verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that he may obtain. Be conscious you are in a race, and run that race with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Run that race focused on the finishing line that you may obtain the crown. Verse 25, And every man that striveth for mastery, that's what you have to strive for, don't strive for mediocrity. Don't strive for a low level. Don't strive for an ordinary kind of life, ordinary kind of behavior. Strive and endeavor for the mastery, for maturity, for perfection. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, self-controlled in all things, self-denying 
in all things incorruptible. Now they do each obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so wrong. And he is making himself an example. I therefore so on, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under. I don't try to keep Peter's body under for him. I don't try to keep Timothy's body under for him. I don't try to keep Docker's body under for her. I don't try to keep uh, Teresa's uh, body uh, under for her. Everyone does it for himself. I, Paul, I keep under my body. What does that mean? It says, my eyes, I control. My hands, I control. My feet, I put under subjection. My life, the totality of my life, I put under control. Why do I bring everything to subjection? Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. You will not be a castaway, but you'll put your tongue under. You put your eyes under. You put your hands under control. You put your ideas under. Let others speak. And don't be the one that will also talk, 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 talk. Put everything under. And be conscious every time that if you are going to have the mastery, if you're going to have maturity, if you're going to bring your life to perfection, you must be better today than you were yesterday. More controlled today than you were yesterday. More yielded and submissive today than you were yesterday. Because, you know, the danger is this, that if you are today what you were yesterday, and you are tomorrow what you are today. The danger is that until the day of reckoning, you'll always be like that. No forward move. No improvement. No maturity. No required holiness. No perfection. No mastery. You'll have the mastery in Jesus' name. Colossians Chapter 1, reading from verse 21, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now as they reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy, to present you holy, holy in heart, holy in tongue, holy in language, holy in outlook, holy in appearance, holy in your thoughts, holy in your activities, holy in your intimacy, holy in your attitude, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Verse 23, if he continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Look at verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man. Whom we preach, warning every man. You see, Paul the Apostle 
was a balanced preacher. Paul, the apostle, was a focused leader. He knew his calling. And he wouldn't be intimidated by those who are deliberately hard in a Christian life. He will still go to them and warn them. There are pastors and preachers who have let some people alone. They are bad. Let them go worse. They are terrible. Let them be rotten. I don't want to soil myself. I don't want to hurt myself. The more you help him, the more you help her to shape up, to rise up, to cleanse up, and go the way of righteousness and make him and make her go towards heaven, the more he will hurt you. And the more she will hurt you. Therefore, leave them alone. Paul the apostle said, no, I'm not going to leave them alone. I warn every man. He says, I'm preaching and warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. How many people are we to present perfect? Tell me out aloud. Are you one of them? That's why I'll talk to you if I see something going wrong. Challenge you if I see something not right. And purge you if I see something that shouldn't be there. And correct and even chastise and discipline when I see things that ought not to be there. You might fight back in your ignorance. You might strike me back in your ignorance. You might say something for thousands to hear that will hurt me for your ignorance, I'll still get back to you for your good so that you can get to heaven. You will get to heaven. I might have to drag you. I might have to draw you. I might have to pull you. I might have to pester you. Whatever. We will all get to heaven in Jesus' name. It says, who we preach? warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus whereunto I also labor striving according to his walking which walketh in me mightily we are coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 I read from verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man, that nobody, that no Christian, that no member go beyond and defraud his neighbor in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all sorts, as we have also forewarned you and testified, for God has not called us to uncleanness, but, but, say it aloud, but unto holiness. And the Lord make us all holy the way he demands in Jesus' name. Second Peter chapter 3, I read from verse 11. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness? A conversation, a manner of life, our interaction, everything should be holy and godly. 
looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that she may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. The Lord will help us. The Lord will qualify us. The Lord will make us in heart and life and ministry what we ought to be in Jesus' name. Point number two, recognizing and recovering the running uh, hirelings. We're coming to Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. But in a great house, in a great congregation, in a great church, in a large church, there are not only vessels of gold and vessels of silver, but also of wood and of earth some to honor and some to dishonor. The Lord by the Spirit here speaks of some who are to dishonor. They dishonor the name of the Lord. They dishonor the calling the Lord has given us. They dishonor the ministry he has given us collectively as we are striving to move forward. They are drawing us back as we're striving to be pure and purer, they're trying to make us impure. As we're striving to do what is right, they're doing what is wrong, and they dishonor. And it's like they're running away from their real duty, and they're going to places and doing things that will bring the ministry, the church, into disrepute. What do we do? Do we abandon them? No, we cannot. No, we will not. No, we must not. We recognize them and we recover them. They are running away from the calling that the Lord has given them. They are hirelings. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 12. John chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 12. It says in chapter 10, verse 12, But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose son sheep and the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep, and flees, and runneth. And the wolves scattereth them, and catches them, and scattereth the sheep. That's talking about his church. That's talking about the congregation. There are times um, unsightly things happen in a congregation by a careless fellow, by a careless person. And then it's like the door that should have been closed to the wolf outside, that door is open. And the wolf runs in. And that hireling, instead of going to the door and closing the door and dealing with that wolf, will run away. And the wolf will have the freedom and the liberty to scatter the flock of God and to destroy the sheep. Those hirelings, because they profess to be workers, they profess to be ministers, and yet when the wolf comes, they don't have the stamina, the courage, the conviction, the strength to wage and to confront the wolf. They run away. Seek for them, look for them, and challenge them. If everybody ran away like that, 
what will become of the church of the living God. Look at verse 13. The hireling flees because it's an hireling and cares not for the sheep. Doesn't want to sacrifice anything. Doesn't want to give up anything. Doesn't want to endure anything for the unity and for the building up of the fold of the people of God. You will not be a runaway hireling in Jesus' name. And if you have been running and you are here tonight, come back and settle down. There is work for everyone to do. You will not fail in your service in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 56. I read from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 56. I'm reading from verse 10. There is what men are blind. As things happen, that will scatter the congregation, that will discourage the new converts, that will blindfold the ignorant, the watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They love ease. And they love that easy life so much, they forget their people in their house fellowship. And they forget the sinners in their community. They forget the people they have to reach out to and bring into the fold. Verse 11, yea, they greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They do not understand how weak their people are, how confused their people are, how scattered their people are, and they're not reaching out to them. They keep on doing the uh, thing, they do the unprofitable things, they do without checking up on their sheep that have been scattered. They all look to their own gain, everyone to his gain from his quarter. What are we to do to those watchmen? What to see them down? And what to convict them? And to change them? And to make them understand they are not doing a profitable work in the kingdom. And we're to make them understand, we should not say, well, that's what those people do. It's none of my concern. It's part of your concern. You see your brother going astray. You see your sister going astray. And then you look the other way. You can't do that. You check them. You correct them. You rebuke them. You bring them under conviction. And you check up on them those run away hirelings to come back to their post of duty. Walk on them. And as you walk on them, a mighty change will happen. Think about those who are not here tonight who ought to be here. Think about those who make it a practice of missing the workers' training. Think about those who make it a practice of always coming late. Think about those who come, but they don't even jot down anything. Think about those who come, and they probably do not bring a Bible. Think about those who come, they're with their Bibles. They're just looking up like this. They don't open the Bible. You know, if you see them, are they going to be what they ought to be on the wall? Check up on them. Talk to them. There'll be a change. You will make the change. I said you will make the change. Look at Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy. Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel against the leaders in the church, 
against the workers in the church. Those who are careless, those who are nonchalant, those who are backsliding, those who are no more consecrated, those who are no more looking at the work and wanting to be their best on the work, those who are disturbing other people, those who are hindering other people, those who are talking down on the message of life, message of holiness, look at them and it says prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Those who are telling dreams instead of preaching the word. And those who are narrating stories instead of quoting the Bible. It says prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, thus says the Lord God unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves should not the shepherds feed the flocks. Those who come to the workers training on Saturday, but on Sunday they will not lead the house fellowship. And the leaders in the district, the leaders in the group, who will sit at home and will not supervise even though they are not no competent teachers in those house fellowships, how will they know? Since they don't even go around, but they come dutifully every Saturday and they feed themselves and they will not feed the flock of God. I pray the Lord will change and transform us in Jesus' name. Verse 4, the diseased have you not strengthened? We can teach superficially, and yet the teaching, just quoting scriptures, will not interpret the scriptures and touch the people where they hurt. And we're not strengthening the people. We still keep close to the verses of the Bible, but we're not explaining expounding, applying to touch the people where they hitch. Neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them will become like tyrants become like great despotic rulers will become like domineering people so that the people will fear you more than they fear God the people will bend and submit to you more than the bench and submit to God. And you make yourself a Lord, a God, an idol over the people. Such people, we need to show them their error. And as they are shown their error, we show them how to repent. We show them how to call upon the Lord. They want us to fear them, but no, you will not fear them. Give me a good amen. amen. You know, a little weak amen will make you remain fearful. Amen. Praise the Lord. You have the heart. You have the mind. You have the courage. You have the backbone to correct those who are wrong and those who run away hirelings. God will use you to bring them back to the place of rectitude in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 23. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 13. And I have seen fully in the prophets of Samaria. I have seen foolishness in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal 
and cause my people to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible sin. They commit adultery. Can you think of a prophet committing adultery? A preacher committing adultery? Can you think of a leader committing adultery? Can you think of a person that has an important position in the church to save sinners, to sanctify believers, to transform the lives of others, committing adultery, having illegitimate children, and they still remain in the priesthood. They walk in lies, they strengthen also the hands of evil doers that none does return from his wickedness. They don't influence anybody to repent, but they harden people to remain in their sin and wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. The Lord restore them in Jesus' name. That chapter 23, verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. The Lord use you and use me to restore those run away hirelings in Jesus' name. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. Reading from verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The son of Amittai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. And he went to Joppa. And he found the sheep going to Tashish. So he paid the fear thereof and went down to go with them unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. You know how God recovered that runaway prophet, not with a smile, not with a God bless you, not with an easy hand, not with patting at the back, not with showing favor while he was running away in rebellion, but with chastisement, with the rod of correction, with the storm on the sea, and with the swallowing up by the whale. And eventually he surrendered, and when he surrendered, the Lord gave him the commission again. When people are doing wrong, when people become like Cronaway Jonah, when people become like hirelings, and they're not concentrating on the work and the duty, the Lord has called them for, we're not going to pat them at the back, keep on smiling at them. We we'll talk to them pointedly. We talk to them sharply that others may fear so that they will come back and be restored fully in Jesus' name. Jonah chapter 2. I read from verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. 
after the chastisement came, after the discipline came, after the wrath of God came, after the storm, he said, when I fainted, then I said, I will not pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, the hyaline, had been recovered. And the runaway had been brought back. In our midst, in your group, all runaway hirelings will be brought back in Jesus' name. In the old district, all runaway hirelings will run after them, will reach out to them, will bring them back in Jesus' name. And all those in our state, all those in every state, they are supposed to be workers. They are supposed to be ministers. They are supposed to be preachers of the word. But they are running and running further and further away. You reach out to them. You call them back. You recover them. They will be restored in Jesus' name. Will you do it? Will you do it? Verse 2, arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose, and he went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. According to the word of the Lord, you will, I will, we'll do it together in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 26. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he had said he tried to join himself to the disciples, but they all were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of the Lord. Saul, who became Paul, had been converted. But the disciples and the believers in Jerusalem will not receive him because they didn't know, they didn't trust that was really converted. And now Barnabas was the one that stretched forth a hand of fellowship and he brought him to the apostles and he testified concerning him and he received him. You will do likewise. Verse 28, And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Chapter 11, Acts, chapter 11, reading from verse 25. Acts, chapter 11, verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. Saul had retired to his hometown. He was going to rest was going to keep serving the Lord, but privately. Then Barnabas went after him. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves of the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. That ministry of Barnabas, all of us will possess in Jesus' name. James chapter 5, verse 19. James chapter 5, verse 19, brethren, 
if any of you, any among you, any brother, any sister, brethren, if any of you, anyone who has been part of us as members, as workers, as ministers, as preachers, as our fellowship leaders, as zona leaders, as women refs, have been part of us, she's been part of us before. Brethren, if any of you do hear from the truth and one convert him and one restore him, let him know that she which converts, he which restores the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The Lord use you. The Lord use me. The Lord use us to bring restoration to those who have run away in Jesus' name. Point number three now. Reaching and reaping the ready harvest. Reaching and reaping the ready harvest. Second Timothy chapter 2. I read from verse 19, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and vessels of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man, if a woman, if a brother minister, if a sister minister, if a preacher, if a pastor purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. The harvest field is ready and ripened. And the Lord is calling on us that will reach out and go reap the ready harvest. Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. When he saw the multitudes as you go on the streets of the major cities in our land, and you see the multitudes in the motor parks, see the multitudes on the sideways, see the multitudes in your streets. It says Jesus saw the multitude and was moved with compassion. When you see the multitudes of people, you'll be asking yourself, if the rapture were to take place today, how many of these multitudes will get to heaven? If death was to come to any of these multitudes today, how many of them will make it to heaven? And if anything should happen, that life comes to an end. In the midst of the situation in which they're living, how many of them will get to heaven? That will spur you to action and it will bring compassion, like the compassion in the heart of Christ. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted, and they were scattered abroad. Scattered, 
into the synagogues, scattered into the various temples in the land, scattered into the various denominational assemblies, but they were and they are a sheep having no shepherd. Then says he to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that ye will send forth laborers into his harvest. The harvest is ready, the harvest is ripened, and the Lord wants us to send laborers to the harvest field. Matthew chapter 10, reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 10, verse 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go rather to religious people who are lost. They have not found their way and recover them and preach the gospel of salvation unto them. Recover their souls. Verse 7, And as she go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Amen. Cleanse the lepers. Amen. Raise the dead. Amen. Cast out devils. Amen. Freely ye have received, freely give. You will not charge money for your preaching. You will not charge money for your ministration. You will not charge money for preaching in the bus. Ah, I can't hear you, amen. And any good thing you do in the church, like ushers, like security, like singers, like sad scripture teachers, like house fellowship leaders, like women leaders, like youth leaders, like evangelists and soul winners out there, you will not place any financial uh, remuneration on your service in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them to unto you before his face into every city and place whither he himself should come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. The twelve are not in all. The seventy are not in all. He needs more reapers. He needs more workers. That's why we go after those who are run away and we restore them. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 12. Mark chapter 6, verse 12. Here's the record of when he sent the 12 out, what he sent them for to do, and what they actually did. Mark chapter 6, verse 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. They themselves had repented and sent them out that men should repent. They had come to Christ and he sent them out that men should repent and come to Christ. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Our time has come. 
Your time has come. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. Neither said they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in a season, and he has reserved, he reserves unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. He has left us here and has left the work in our hands. He has reserved for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. But these shepherds and these harvesters and these reapers were negligent. And so God had a controversy with them. He said, the controversy had with them is that they are not seeing, they are not realizing that God has reserved unto them the appointed weeks of the harvest. And the harvest was coming to an end, and many of their people were not saved. The same thing with us today, the harvest is coming to an end. Christ is about to come. Many people are not saved yet. We need to wake up so that the Lord will not have controversy with us on the judgment day. We'll reach out to the lost. They'll be saved in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. The harvest is past. The summer is ended, and we are not saved. Will there be people on the final day when everything has wound up, when everything has ended, when the day of service and the day of reaping will have come to an end? Will there be people that will say the harvest has passed and the summer is ended and we are not saved? For the heart of the daughter of my people and my heart, I am black, astonishment has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? Look at Jeremiah chapter 12. Verse 5, Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how then canst thou contend with horses? If at this time now, when there's a little storm, a little rain, a little pressure, a little challenge, a little security problem. If at this time you're running with the footmen and you're weary and you're saying there's a lion on the street, there are difficulties in the land and we cannot do anything, how canst thou contend with the horses? If in the land of peace, relative, relative peace, where thou trusted, they wearied thee. Then how will thou deal in the swelling of Jordan? I pray at this time of opportunity, this day of opportunity, will all rise up and seek to save the lost in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. Jeremiah chapter 50. I'm reading from verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6. My people have been lost sheep. They go to church. My people have been lost sheep. They have Bibles at home. They hide under their pillow. My people have been lost sheep. 
they belong to a denomination but you don't understand what it means to come to Christ and be born again my people have been lost sheep their shepherds have caused them to go astray their preachers their pastors their leaders their lay readers they have caused them to go astray they have turned away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. That's why you are reaching out to them every time, every week. In particular, this week, you are going to reach out to them. Luke chapter 19, I read from verse 10. Luke chapter 19, we're reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. If Christ were to be physically present here on us today, that's what he'll be doing. The Son of Man, Christ, our Savior, is come to seek and to save that which was lost. If Christ lived big in you, if Christ lived mighty in you, if Christ lives active in you, that's what we'll be doing, the Son of Man, the Son of God, Christ, our Savior, in you, will seek to save that which is lost. Look at verse 13, and he called his ten sermons and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Will you? Occupy till I come. I said, will you? You will not retire. You will not be tired. You will not abandon the work. You will not run away. You will not be a hireling. You'll be a harvester in Jesus' name. Occupy till I come. John chapter 4, verse 34. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. You will not stop until you finish. I will not stop until I finish. Say it for yourself. You'll continue till you finish in Jesus' name. Say not ye, are yet four months, and then comes harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. They are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, you'll not miss your reward. And gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Herein is the saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I send you to reap whereon ye bestowed no labor. All the men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. I send you to reap, is sending you out. Are you there? Where are you? Is sending you out. I send you to reap where you have bestowed no labor. As you go to reap, the Lord will bless your efforts. The Lord will prosper the work in your hand. The Lord will bring souls out of the wilderness of sin and bring them into the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. From now, this work will continue to prosper in your hand. And souls will be converted and souls will be ushered in to the kingdom through you, through me, through us together every day in Jesus' name. And those who are converted and those who are brought in will be conserved in the kingdom of God. Your converts will not be lost. Your converts will not perish. 
your converts will not go away from the kingdom. You will abide unto the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. He has a work to do, and the Lord has chosen you. He has a work to do, and the Lord has selected you. He has a work to do, and the Lord has appointed you. Sanctified tools for special tasks. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord, that the Lord will wash out of your heart, cleanse from your heart, and take away from your life anything that is tying you down, that the Lord will take away from you any wage and any so easily besetting sin, so that the Lord will make you better prepared for this work he has given you to do. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray that he'll give you a clear sight, a clear vision, that the Lord will give you real commitment and consecration. You'll be diligent, sanctified, self-denying, focused, committed, doing this work until multitudes are ushered into the kingdom of God.